<laughs> we see your screen, Pat. <laughs> we, see your in, we see your entire screen. Only seven emails, I'm impressed. So maybe we need a different screen. Started. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jessica Meyerson. I'm the Community Advisor for the Software Preservation Network and Research Program Officer at Educopia Institute. And today we have the sincerest pleasure of kicking off our seven part series of webinars that explore the fair use code and other legal tools for software preservation. This series is co-hosted by the Association of Research Libraries and the Software Preservation Network. Every episode will be recorded, transcribed, and posted to the SPIN website, freely available for all. Today we are presenting episode one, the Code of Best Practices for Fair Use and Software Preservation, Why and How. This is gonna be an overview and roundtable discussion with members of the Code of Best Practices research team, which include, Patricia Ofterheide, university professor in the School of Communication and founder of the Center for Media and Social Impact at American University. Peter Yazzie, professor, uh, professor emeritus at American University Law School and founder of the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic and its program on intellectual property and information justice. Krista Cox, director of public policy initiatives at the Association of Research Libraries and Brandon Butler, Director of Information Policy at the University of Virginia Libraries. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, I would ask for all of our attendees, and we're so grateful that you're here, just to reiterate, we ask that you all turn your video off unless you are presenting or speaking, and this is to preserve bandwidth. Also, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. This will improve the quality of the recording and aid in voice-to-text transcription. If you have any questions during the course of the presentation and discussion, please do type them into the chat box in your Zoom control panel. And once we open up the audience Q&A, we encourage you to continue submitting questions in the chat, and we will do our best to address answers in the order that they were submitted, questions were submitted. And any questions that are not addressed by the end of the episode will be recorded in the chat and addressed during either a subsequent episode or on the, episode, uh, on the website once the recording and transcript have been posted. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Brandon and Kristen to kick off our discussion. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings from the uh, sun-drenched uh, fifth floor of the Alderman Main Library in beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia. And I see Krista is coming in loud and clear from ARL. Hey, Krista. Hey everyone, um, we got some sun here too, although it's very windy outside. Yes, yeah, we, I heard trees falling in my neighborhood yesterday. Um, so those are not highlights from the code, but now you know the weather in uh, mid-Atlantic USA. Um, so we're really excited to kick off this series of webinars on the Code of Best Practices uh, in Fair Use for Software Preservation. Um, this is just a, a wonderfully exciting project. We're thrilled to have Spin as um, a collaborator with us on this. Um, the, the power and the expertise of this network has just been crucial for making this, this possible. And so, you know, to the extent that, that this code becomes a useful uh, tool for you all, um, we'll be thrilled because we've learned so much from you and we've had so much fun getting to know you. So. Uh, we hope that we can uh, introduce the code to you uh, over the next several weeks. Um, Pat, I think, is controlling the slides. I think we can move on to the next one. So the first thing we wanted to do at the very beginning is um, give you the, the lightning version of what's in the code um, and what's the subject matter that we talk about in this particular code of best practices. Uh, later on in the presentation, you'll learn more about fair use generally from Peter Yazi, and you'll learn more about codes of best practices generally from Pat after Heidi. Um, so this is sort of a, a, a getting oriented webinar where, again, we'll give you a, a quick preview. Each of these situations is going to get a much deeper dive in a future webinar. So 
you know, this is just to let you know where we're going to be headed, and then um, and then you'll know what to expect. So, before I get into the substance of the first principle, I wanted to also make two quick overhead over overarching notes. One is if you look at the code, you'll see that there are two assumptions about what kinds of um, work is being done in each of these situations. One is that this is always work in support of research, teaching, and learning. So, you know, if you read about uh, George R. R. Martin writing all of his books on vintage uh, word processing so software and you thought, well, that's really cool, I'll bring it back and sell it again, this isn't about you, right? This is for all of our uh, brothers and sisters in the archives, libraries, and uh, research collections, museums, the folks who are saving this software so that people can go back and study it and use it for purposes of you know, information retrieval and, and understanding. So that's the first scope note. And the second is throughout these uh, discussions, um, the norms that, that we surface um, always assume that the thing that you're working with is out of commerce. That is, um, we're not talking typically about using software that you can still go out and buy somewhere. We're talking about a software that needs to be preserved precisely because uh, there's no way to, to get a new copy uh, from the people who are authorized to sell you a copy. So with those two assumptions under our belt, I'll do the first principle and then Krista and I will just go back and forth real quick. Um, so next week we will go deep on uh, this first principle and the second principle. The first principle is about accessioning, stabilizing, evaluating, and describing uh, digital objects, in particular software. So this is the first thing you do, right? You have a box of media, disks, um, you know, floppies, uh, hard drives, whatever, and you've got to figure out what's in there. Can it still run? Um, you need to make a record of what it is. And so this, um, this first principle talks about what's permissible as that first step in the workflow. And the other kind of overarching note I should make is that these principles um, follow, they sort of follow a preservation workflow from the beginning to the end or from the first most inner recesses of the institution and ever further outward in terms of access and availability. So that's the pattern we'll be following. And so now Krista can talk about principle two, which we'll also talk about next week. Yeah, so this, um, this follows nicely from the first principle um, and it's part of that workflow. So in addition to what Brandon mentioned about, you know, preserving and describing that object, another um, aspect to that is documenting that software and how it operates. So for example, in its original operating environment, um, you might wanna take some screenshots or record how it's being used, or um, if, uh, you know, they, a lot of times there are expert users on a particular type of software that um, uh, the average user might not understand how all the features work. So you might wanna document how that works. And as Brandon said, we'll go much deeper into um, how these two situations work in our next episode. Great. Um, so the third principle is when we start talking about access. And so uh, in two weeks, we'll start talking about providing access to software for use in research, teaching, and learning. And this principle in particular focuses on providing uh, access to affil users affiliated with your institution. And that doesn't have to be local access physically. It can be remote access, but it's access to users who have a direct connection to your institution. Um, and you know, this is ultimately, we heard over and over again that uh, preservation is for access. And if you're not uh, making something accessible, um, then the whole, the whole, our, our, the whole enterprise um, can come into question. So access was really important. So we felt it was really important to try to help address that situation. And now we'll go to the next principle. Uh, and of course, this uh, follows again nicely with the one that Brandon just mentioned, because this is also about providing that access. Um, and this is something else that we heard over and over again. Um, so I was really excited that uh, we were able to, to describe this situation in the code, and that's providing broader network access um, that's shared across multiple collections and institutions, because this is already the way our um, cultural heritage institutions work. They want to combine resources 
collections. I mean, no institution could possibly collect everything themselves. Um, and so this is about uh, sharing those resources and working with other institutions. Great. Um, and then finally, uh, we have sort of a, 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 the fifth principle sort of falls outside of that continuum we just described. So principles one through four follow follow a piece of software from ingest all the way to you know networked access across a, 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 a group of institutions. And then the fifth principle deals specifically with files that are in source code, uh, because the folks that we spoke with from this community told us that um, files in source code, you know, human readable, reusable content raise separate issues that deserve their own treatment in a separate principle. Um, and so that's where we end up in the code is with this fifth principle about source code. Um, now, to understand how the code works, um, you need to understand, I think, the key advantages of a code of best practices as an approach to fair use. Um, the first is that a code of best practices is a guide of as a guide to reasoning and not a set of rules. And so, when um, when you sort of Google fair use, what you often will find is, um, I'm afraid, a lot of bad information that is expressed in you know terms of you know hard numbers, you know rules of thumb about how many words or how many pixels can be in your fair use file. Um, these arbitrary limits and metrics that can really um, trip us up. Um, those arbitrary limits and metrics are often set by people who are outside of a user community. They're dictated to you by publishers or industry representatives. The fair use best practices come from within the community. They're based on a professional consensus that's grounded in the values and the norms, um, and frankly, the needs of the community. So the codes of best practices aren't negotiated with copyright holders. They're not a kind of you know, minimum standard that they're promised they won't sue us about. Um, instead, they are a, a statement of what's best. Um, and so uh, the codes of best practices intend to really express the values of a community rather than something that's imposed or sort of negotiated from the outside. Um, so for each, here, Krista, would you like to talk about the structure of these yeah, principles? Yeah. Um, so, uh, the way the code is structured is um, there is a description for each of the situations that Brandon and I mentioned, um, and it describes the the type of thing that the principal refers to. So, as um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, as an example of documenting that software um, in its original operating environment, it'll give some examples of the of the type of things that we heard from people in this community. And then it states the principle, and then it goes through a series of limitations, um, things for people to consider as they determine uh, whether to rely on fair use and how to rely on fair use, because um, oftentimes things like donor agreements or um, how broadly something is shared and how broadly you provide access to it can impact the way we, um, we rely on these principles and rely on fair use. So all of this stuff is grounded in something called fair use, right? We keep saying these words over and over again. Um, and we know a very basic thing about fair use, whatever it is, is it's, it's a right to use copyrighted material without permission or payment, sometimes, right? <laughs> Under some circumstances. Um, and, you know, when you try to puzzle out what those circumstances are, you're often pointed to the four factors in the law. And when you try to think about what those four factors mean, uh, without any other aid or, or input, you end up looking like all these poor folks from stock photos, um, confused, right? Frustrated, annoyed, because the four factors don't tell you enough. Uh, and typically people who talk to you about fair use don't tell you enough to actually help you make decisions. So. Uh, that lack of knowledge about how fair use actually works uh, leads to, in many communities, and we found it in this community, it leads to a, a kind of permission culture um, where projects are afraid to move forward without express permission from a copyright holder. Um, or if they move forward, they move forward um, 
very uh, in the dark, right? People do stuff, but they don't talk to each other about what they're doing. It's hard to develop good norms and practices because uh, you're afraid that what you're doing might not actually be safe. And so you're, you're unable to talk to each other about what you're up to. And I, um, I think that there's also sometimes this myth that's perpetuated around fair use, um, or as Brandon said, kind of this bad information that fair use is super unpredictable, it's um, you know, only on a case by case basis. But what this code was intended to do was to solve some of that by saying, um, you know, we have these four factors and it's actually a lot more predictable than, um, than some people think. Yeah. So this is a good spot to turn it over to uh, Peter Yazzie, who's sort of a world's expert in fair use and can give us the deep dive on how we know that fair use is so much more reliable than maybe some people want us to think. Peter, you're muted. Oh, I think you're still on mute, Peter. Can you reach down and get your microphone? In the bottom left corner. Or Jessica, can you unmute Peter? One Peter, try now. Thank you. I appreciate it. For some reason, the I can't, couldn't find the unmute button on my screen. So, just as Brandon began with a couple of of premises for his discussion, I'd like to do the same. There are two very general points about fair use that are probably worth making before we get into any further into the particulars, because these two points at least are very, very clear. One is that when you're engaging in fair use in one of the categories of activity which are sanctioned under this legal doctrine, then you are not engaging in copyright infringement. In other words, sometimes you hear people describe fair use as though it were infringement that was tolerated somehow or privileged somehow, but still infringement. And the law is extremely clear that fair use, whatever it is, and we're going to go further in a moment on the question of what it is and how you know, is a non-infringing activity. Now, that's important. Here's another important premise. In the Copyright Act, which I'm sure some of you are closely familiar with and, and others may, may have had the good luck not to have acquired such familiarity so far, there are some provisions other than the fair use provision that deal specifically with issues of preservation. Uh, unfortunately for the software preservation community, those specific exceptions for preservation don't have much, if anything, to do with software. Happily for this community, it doesn't matter. Because another thing that is clear beyond argument about fair use is that it exists to complement and supplement whatever specific exceptions relating to preservation you can find in Title 17 of the United States Code. So it's Fair use is not infringement, and fair use exists in addition to, it's a supplement and complement to specific preservation exceptions. With those two things out of the way, having talked in effect about what it isn't, now I'll, I'll try to talk a little bit about what it is. And perhaps the first thing that needs to be said about this safety valve doctrine is that it's an old one, that the idea goes back, we're not sure how long, into the, into the 18th century perhaps. The term, as courts in the United States began to use it, goes back in, at least to 1841, 
it's it's basic it's structural it's it's at the heart of copyright doctrine it's not a a later add-on it's an integral part of the whole scheme and that's true even though it didn't actually get written into the statute in so many words until 1976. Now, why is fair use such an old, venerable, structural part of our copyright law? It's because it directly reflects the values that are baked into our copyright system as it was conceived by the guys who wrote the Constitution and the first and every subsequent Congress and all the courts that have had an opportunity to think and write about the issue over the years. Many people understand copyright as the right to control the use of a work after it's made, and, and, and that's certainly part of it. But in the US, we don't have copyright to reward creators or investors simply because somehow inherently they deserve it. We have copyright because we assume that giving limited authority over works to those who create them will encourage the production of more new material to promote science and useful arts, as the Constitution puts it, for the benefit of all. And this is a, an instrumentalist view of copyright. It's not a natural rights view of copyright. And it's a really important origin story because it flows through everything we know, everything we have decided in the last several hundred years about the specific ways in which copyright doctrine functions. And that includes fair use doctrine. So, Copyright law has two major modes. It, it, it provides in two different ways to, for incentives to the, the production of new cultural value. The monopoly is, of course, one of those modes. It gives innovators some protection in the marketplace. The other mode of incentive is the one that speaks to the activities of what might be called follow-on creators, new makers, scholars, teachers, archivists, and others. And this is the aspect, or the, these are the features of copyright law that say sometimes new makers don't have to observe the niceties of copyright law. Sometimes they don't have to get permission from others in order to engage in their valued activities. These two modes of encouraging new creativity, giving rights to creators, and providing access to follow-on makers have to be in balance, because without such a balance, the system is going to tilt in, in one direction or another. Now in the old days, and especially before 1976, there were a bunch of features of copyright law that had the effect of achieving balance by limiting the copyright mono monopoly. Copyrights lasted a shorter time. They had to be renewed after 28 years. The scope of copyright protection was relatively narrow. Over time, most of those limits have become much less important as protections for access on the part of, of follow-on creators. And another doctrine, the ancient and venerable doctrine of fair use that I described earlier, has emerged as being increasingly significant. And then, as I, I mentioned a moment ago, in 1976, finally, <clears throat> after a lot of strong and effective advocacy from the representatives of the library community, this doctrine, which had been around in the case law for a long time, was finally written into the statute. And what the, the drafters of that statute, what 
came to be called the 1976 Copyright Act, tried to do was to, to reflect or incorporate in their um, provision in Section 107 what, what they understood to be the considerations that judges had been using for longer, at least, at least a century in order to deal with these fair use cases when they arose. And that took the form of the famous or infamous four factors, the considerations which, whatever else they might look at, courts were supposed to take into account in deciding whether a challenged use, one that a copyright owner thought should have been licensed, but that the user insisted fell outside the realm of that copyright owner's control, was or was not uh, fair use. And I think this was a good faith attempt on the part of Congress to help both courts that were going to have to continue to apply the doctrine case by case, and also users to understand better what the actual scope of fair use rights might be. And it could have been successful. It wasn't. For a variety of reasons, of which the most important may be that this list of four factors, which is unweighted and unranked, ends with a factor, the market effect, which is the most, excuse me, the, the market effect, which, which looks by virtue of its position like the most significant factor. We had after 1978 a, a, a really bad decade, a decade in which courts were extremely constrained and everyone else in the copyright system in effect took their cue from those courts and fair use was widely understood to be extremely limited in its scope of application. Well, in the early 1990s, that began to change. And a shift took place, a very rapid shift, a shift that really was in substantial part accomplished by the time the U.S. Supreme Court decided the case of Campbell against Ake of Rose in 1994, and the mode, the very, the very um, restrictive mode of analysis that the courts had been using up to then, and that people in various practice settings had necessarily, looking at the court decisions, adopted internally for their own predictive use is what I'm about to do. Will it be or won't it be a fair use? That was very quickly swept away. And the courts instead began with the leadership and guidance of the Supreme Court to engage in a much more thorough kind of interest balancing as part of their typical fair use analysis. And they also came to recognize that Fair use was not only structurally essential to the copyright enterprise, but that it also represented the channel by which First Amendment free expression values came into and were given weight in the copyright system. So jumping ahead to the present day, we've had 25 years or so of consistent and, and, and prominent judicial decision-making about fair use in this new mode, the mode that was adopted by the Supreme Court in 1994. And these days, as the slide suggests, judges who are confronted with fair use cases take all of the factors very seriously. And in particular, they pay a lot of attention to the first fair use factor, which is the one that asks about the purpose of the use. And when they ask about purpose, whether or not the use is one that has a purpose that 
should qualify it or tend to qualify it as a fair use. The specific question that they ask is whether the use is being done for a transformative purpose. This is a new name for an old idea. It's an approach that strongly favors fair use in situations where the follow-on use has a purpose that's different and, and distinct and adds some social or cultural value. The term is an important one to parse. It's a, it's a legal term of art. It's being used in a special legal rather than a general dictionary sense. That's important because the cases teach us that the repurposing that makes a purpose transformative, or the intended repurposing that makes a purpose transformative can have a lot of different forms. Sometimes it may involve modifying the original work, but in other situations it'll entail putting that work into a new context while maintaining its content and character as faithfully as possible. That latter idea of transformativeness is, of course, a very clear one um, in areas like archival uh, practice and an important one. Here, legacy objects are being copied and reproduced for research and study purposes, new purposes, not so that they can be used to displace their commercial counterparts, to perform the functions for which they were originally created. So that's transformativeness. We'll have a lot to say over the course of, of the weeks to come about the specific applications of this general concept at various stages in the preservation workflow. The second thing that judges almost always ask about in fair use cases these days is whether if the use is a transformative one, it's an appropriate one in terms of quantity or quality, in terms, in other words, of amount. And that determination of appropriateness or proportionality, as one might put it, is, can't be made in, an, in a vacuum. It is, of course, made in relation to the ascertained transformative purpose. So if I'm writing an article and I, about a, a poet, and I want to quote a few lines from a, a long poem, that may be fine if my purpose is to explicate those lines. If I want to attach the whole poem as an appendix to my article, that may or may not be appropriate. But of course, sometimes the appropriate amount to use to fulfill a new transformative purpose is the work in its entirety. And that is yet again an observation about fair use very clearly established in the case law that's quite important in thinking about the application of fair use to archival practice. There are other things that also come into the judicial consideration of whether or not a particular use is fair, and that also should be considered by would-be users when they're making their own prospective decisions about whether to proceed with particular uses. And of these, one of the most important is whether or not there is out there in the field documented evidence of what the practice community, uh, the professional cadre of which the individual user or would-be user is a part, thinks are good practices, the customs, if you will, around which the field has come together and that it believes are appropriate in the fulfillment of whatever the professional goal or mission of these practitioners may be, or sometimes the practices that even though they have not yet emerged as fully customary, the field nevertheless believes would be essential to achieving the mission that its members share which leads us then to a question. We've been 25 years with this new understanding of fair use. 
what the courts have had to say is is extremely consistent and extremely liberating in its implications. It's stable, predictable, and I might even say user-friendly doctrine. But in practice, not all use communities, not all professional communities, not all groups of practitioners who are potential beneficiaries of this change in judicial approach have yet received or internalized the good news. Perhaps that's because, as Brandon suggested earlier, about the because of the amount of toxic misinformation that circulates online and elsewhere, or perhaps it's simply because the doctrine, even as it has been made more predictable in recent years, still seems too amorphous when it is matched up against a risk analysis. And it's that possibility, that latter possibility, that um, has generated the project of which this code of best practices is a part. And I'm going to turn it over now to my collaborator in that project of the last 15 years, Pat Ofterheide. I'm going to proceed, but somebody should tell me if it's not working. Um, so people, people worry when they, when they think about fair use because they see a certain kind of risk. They see legal trouble. They see lost relationships. They believe they might have reputational damage. They talk about legal trouble more, but actually what we discover is most people are worried about lost relationships. Um, yes? Uh, so, uh, we always like to point out that there is some, always some legal risk used with, associated with using your rights, and that's true with any right. But there's also a mission risk associated with failing to do things that you really find core to mission, and you really have to balance both risks, and that's where understanding the very limited risk of all the fair use is very helpful. That's why we created best practices codes in conjunction with fair use, with communities that employ fair use regularly. The first was documentary filmmakers. In 2005, they were very, very skeptical that it would make any difference at all to have a fair use code. Uh, they, um, however, discovered that there was a lot of change, which I'll tell you about. We went on to work with communication scholars. We worked with poets, as Peter has told you. We worked with librarians, including librarians like Brandon and Krista. Uh, we worked with um, a variety of, of organizations, including um, people who did open courseware, film scholars, and dance heritage um, uh, archivists. What happened, what happened was that people moved from no to yes. Documentary filmmakers discovered that uh, they were now able to get work that employed fair use on the air because insurers now agreed that the risk was extremely low. Librarians were able to put digital collections online. Scholars were able to publish new work uncontroversially in journals that had traditionally only accepted permissioned materials. And archivists were able to put up digital exhibits that are permanent exhibits. What we discovered, in short, is that practice makes practice. That fair use, when it's used, expands what is possible for people to do. And that's why we're so excited to be working with you guys. And here are some places where you can get more material. Uh, we will also be putting these URLs, I, with Jessica's help, up into the chat for you. Uh, but they are from all of our organizations. If you are a spin person, then you should go to softwarepreservationnetwork.org. And of course, if you wanted to, you could always read Peter in my book if you just feel like this was not enough. Okay, enjoy. And if you feel like you want to share this PowerPoint, you only want to share part of it, employ fair use. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, Peter, Krista, and Brandon. Um, well, we're going to go ahead and invite all of our attendees today to ask some questions of all of you while we have you together for this uh, kickoff episode. 
Um, just a reminder to everyone to be sure and type your questions into the chat box. Um, I've been monitoring them. I haven't seen anyone um, paste them in quite yet, but I would really uh, recommend and advise all of our attendees to take advantage of having Pat, Peter, Krista, and Brandon on the call um, and to share your own experiences about this as we, as we kick off these discussions. Certainly this Q&A might inform um, where we focus our time in subsequent episodes. So please do share your thoughts and questions. And while we're waiting for people to put questions in the chat, I have a follow on from um, Pat, your discussion of how other communities have adopted the code. So yes. what have you found have been some of the strategies or and or challenges that some of the other communities have faced? Can you talk a little bit more about the process of kind of cultural adoption of the code, which I know you'll you'll describe in, in much more detail with some um, colleagues of yours that have participated in other codes being written. But can you speak to that briefly to give us a sense of, of, of sure. what you're about? And just to let you know, Zoom is just refusing to let me um, use the video, so I'm just going to be stuck with audio. Um, but that's a great question, Jessica, and um, this is where having trusted partners like SPIN is absolutely critical because people look to the anchor institutions in their communities for uh, legitimacy. So some new thing appears, such as a code, and somebody has to say, yes, we're using it, and we're using it to do X. So I think finding, um, having SPIN be able to tell people about that is great. And one of the things that's going to be super important is for people who are on this call and uh, other people you may know to report to SPIN when things change in your institutions, when you do things differently because you were able to use the code. Because until then, what people may be doing is employing fair use more or less quietly and sort of thinking that they're getting away with something and not realizing that they're actually completely legal. Or they might be avoiding taking on a big project because they're not really sure how much of a hassle it's going to be. And when they hear from some of the people they really respect in the community, they're, they're, going, to, um, they're going to feel much safer in that decision. So we find that it, the first person has to be a little bit courageous, but after that, it becomes increasingly what you hope it will always be, which is that you shouldn't need courage to use ordinary rights. And that's, that's our big goal for the code. But certainly having your trusted legitimizers at the beginning is extremely important. We're also, Jessica and I are, are concocting a survey for you, and we really hope that you all take it because it'll provide us with some uh, baseline information on what you need in order to circulate this code more effectively in the community. Yes, ditto, yeah, thank you for that, Pat. Everyone, please do keep a lookout. Again, that documented emphasis on one of those slides, <laughs> documented use is really crucial to the continued expansion of the code. Um, so we have a couple of questions in line for, for Pat, Krista, Peter, and Brandon. This first one, um, I, I'm going to hand off to um, maybe, maybe between Peter, Brandon, and Krista. You might want to touch on this, and certainly no um, we'll get a future episode that will be really focused on this with Jonathan Band and Kendra Albert. But can you speak quickly to how the DMCA affected the overall con concept of fair use as it relates to software preservation? And this is from Mark Myers at the te uh, Texas State Library and Archives. Uh, so since Peter was most recently uh, 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 engaged in, in this uh, stuff, maybe I'll give him a break and I'll jump into this one. And, and Peter and Krista both uh, can add on because they've both got lots of experience with this stuff. Um, so uh, the DMCA is a complicating factor for all fair uses that involve um, digital media because the DMCA creates this kind of extra right. It's not really quite copyright. Uh, we sometimes call it para-copyright. Um, and it's, it sits on top of copyright 
and it says yeah, there's there's all the stuff you get with copyright, but if you're very clever and you also put a digital lock of some kind on your media, then we'll give you an extra right that says nobody gets to crack that lock. Nobody gets to make a, a hack that they can share and no one gets to use that hack in order to um, crack digital locks. And fair use is not a defense to the DMCA in some circuits, in other circuits maybe, and there's enough uncertainty out there to leave everyone sort of scratching their heads and wishing that they could be more secure about this stuff. But there's, so what that means for software is the same thing it means for everything. It means when you're dealing with something that has a digital lock on it, you have the fair use question that tells you, do the core principles of copyright allow me to do what I want to do? And if it's fair use, then the answer will be yes. But then you have another question, which is, if this thing has a digital lock on it, can I circumvent the digital lock? And we find out whether we can circumvent digital locks by looking at specific exemptions that are granted. There, were, there are some throwaway, crummy, totally worthless ones that are in the statute. Um, I'm trying to be objective and uh, you know, play close to the vest. Um, there's some really worthless ones in the statute, but what we really have to do is every three years we go to the Copyright Office and we ask, and we ask for special exemptions for uses that we have to show they're lawful. So we have to have a fair use argument or some other kind of argument, but usually it's a fair use argument. Um, and then we have to go to the Copyright Office and say, this is a lawful use, but we're being prevented from doing it because of the DMCA. And the good news is we did that uh, last year and we won. And when I say we there, all credit uh, goes to the Harvard Cyber Law Clinic and Kendra Albert, Chris Babbitt, and there were two different teams of two students apiece who, who pushed this thing across the goal line with help also from, Ken, from Krista, Jonathan Band, um, a lot of our friends in DC helped with that petition. So, um, but now there is a DMCA exemption for software preservation and it's quite broad. Um, it's a very nice exemption. Um, I'm very proud that we were able to get it. And the Cyber Law Clinic has a, a guide to the exemption sort of the preservationist guide because these exemptions are written almost as if they didn't want you to use them. And so it's really nice to have a translation from copyright office into English. And the Cyber Law Clinic did just exactly that for you. So that's the relationship. And we'll have an entire episode uh, where we get into much more deeply into that um, three or four weeks down the road. So more, more to come. Yeah, and we've got we've got a couple more here um, to follow on from that. Uh, I'll mention too that the link to the guide is now in the chat, and all links that uh, Pat pointed to with her last slide in the presentation will be made available to everyone when we post the episode to the website. So the second question we have is from Sarah. Um, do you see a difference between a true fair use analysis and a more commercially minded risk analysis? Are they the same thing? Can I grab that? One for Peter, yeah. <laughs> it's such a good question. And the answer is that they are distinct and interrelated and that any professional, including any software preservation professional who wants to take advantage of fair use needs to understand and to act on that distinction. Fair use is a legal question, as Brandon and Krista mentioned earlier, and as I tried to reinforce, it's gotten quite predictable over the last 25 years. And the code of best practices here, as other codes of best practices that Pat describes elsewhere um, have, have done, is, is designed to make it even more predictable. Risk analysis is a activity that is undertaken by individuals or more typically within institutions. And the basic question is, how much trouble can we get into if we do this? And is it a kind of trouble we want or a kind of trouble we want to avoid? So it has commercial overtones, it may have reputational overtones. It's, it's, a, it's an absolutely commonplace and necessary activity and different institutions do it differently. Different institutions have different levels of risk tolerance. But you can't do good risk analysis 
about a question involving a copyright regulated activity like this one without first having a good understanding of what your legal rights are. In other words, the clear understanding of your legal rights, and to be clear, fair use where it applies is a right, that understanding has to precede risk analysis because you can't make a judgment about what is at stake in the use without that as an input. It's not the only input, but it is one input. And that leads me to another observation, and that is that one of the things that you can do with a code of best practices like this one is that you can use it as a tool to try to influence risk analysis in your own institutions. If you've got a supervisor or a general counsel or an administrative uh, overseer of some kind who feels very risk averse about all of this apparently difficult and confusing copyright stuff, one of the things you can do with the code of best practices is to give it to them and say, look, our community backed up by a bunch of, of very, very uh, well-qualified and, and critical copyright lawyers who reviewed all of this material, they all think that what we're proposing to do or doing is just fine, that it fits within the parameters of fair use. That can be extraordinarily convincing. So they're different, they're related, and one, that is fair use analysis, needs to proceed and in the best case can significantly influence the other. Thank you, Peter. Um, we also have, we have a question here from James Watson. Krista, I'm going to give this one to you. Uh, can the panel, um, and starting with Krista, maybe discuss in some detail the issue of copyright in terms of software used to create permanent government records? So the context here, it's a question that they often have to look at, whether it's easier to get a copy of this proprietary software, which is more difficult if it's a licensed copy only, versus finding a way through the IT department to replicate the functions of it? Well, um, I mean, I'm interested in what Peter and Brandon have to say about this, but um, I mean, of course, uh, for the, the government information itself, presumably, is probably not under copyright um, if it's created by a government employee in the scope of of their work, um, but as far as accessing the information via the software um, that was used to create it, um, I mean, I would apply what we have in the code because that's third-party software. That's not software that's created by the um, by the government itself. Um, I would I would also just note as a policy issue, there is a federal agency that is proposing. Um, government ownership of software that is created by the government. So that is a policy, a separate policy issue that is just something to be aware of in this space. But I'm, I'm interested, um, Brandon and Peter, if your thoughts differ on this. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm, I, oh, Brandon, please. So I can see, a, I mean, a couple of ways to, to parse the question. And, and James, if you want to chime in in the chat to clarify, there's sort of the forward-looking, prospective, you know, is it better to make our documents in Microsoft Word and then deal with preserving Word forever and, and, and employ fair use and, and we'll do what we have to do to make sure or sh proactively should the government find a way to replicate the functions of something like Word with a non-proprietary software format in order to avoid uh, future you know, pain and suffering? And I think that's sort of a, that's a, a question that, you know, depends on your resourcing and, and it's a, it's a similar to the kind of risk analysis Peter was just describing. There's X amount of discomfort associated with having to preserve the format, but maybe it's also a good format and no open format is, is as useful. Um, but if you're thinking about retroactively, I would agree entirely with Krista. If you've made a bunch of documents using proprietary software, you know, are you better off uh, using that software to open the documents or trying to find a way to hack the documents open with a new tool, I would say fair use would really strongly support you in your efforts to do the former. 
rather than hacking something together to get to the content. Um, but again, it's a strategic question. You know, it's about your resources and what you want to do. But fair use would support you if you wanted to take the former uh, strategy and make the proprietary software the tool that you use. Thank you. Thank you, Krista and Brandon on that. Um, we have one more question I want to make sure that we get to because it's a great uh, forward looking community activity question, which is uh, from Brian Thomas also at TSLAC. So as good practice, is there kind of a template for documenting um, how the situations or particular instances in which a, an organization has relied on fair use? Um, so I think this is a great question, and um, yeah, I'm uh, from from all of the panelists, from all of the research team. I think it would be helpful to have a good sense of how organizations that are interested in contributing to the expansion, the assertion of user rights in this context, and the expansion of the code over time, can document their work. Well, let me let me jump in and and start that very important discussion. And I hope it's a discussion that will continue over coming weeks because it is at a level of granularity that's actually beyond what the, the code itself discusses. But here's what I would suggest, and that is earlier on when I was giving you the, the short introduction to fair use, I suggested that there are really two questions to which any analyst, a legal analyst, a lawyer who is giving you advice in advance of you're doing something, if, you, if you're using a lawyer or on a court that's considering a challenge to what you've done after the fact, however unusual or unlikely that is, and I, I should say that it, it doesn't happen very much. In other words, over 15 years, our history with these codes and best practices suggests that in, 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 in general, users who stay within the codes of best practices or even even sort of expand modestly beyond them simply don't get sued but somebody is making a decision and there are these two questions that come up a legal decision one is was it a use for a transformative purpose and the other is the is the amount of use the material used appropriate for the identified purpose and those i think are the questions about which it would be useful to retain some kind of documentation not at the level of necessarily everyday workflow choices but at the project level if someone it sets out to say well i think we should be we should be saving and making available this this suite of applications or this particular legacy program that I think at the beginning as part of the general discussion, not as an isolated matter, but as part of the general discussion of whether this is a project worth undertaking, it's interesting to talk and take some notes about how the thing you're doing is going to add value that the mirror existence of the original version was not attended was not intended to capture and the other is why are why are you using the or or intending to archive the amount you're intending to archive and if the answer is well because we have the, the only the whole thing is significant that may be the end of the discussion so yeah, I think it's very, very valuable to incorporate those discussions into your project workflow because the contemporaneous documentation should there, however unlikely, ever be, and it is unlikely, a challenge is very, very good evidence, so to speak. I'll stop there. Thank you for that, Peter. Do you, Brandon, Krista, um, with Pat off the line, I'm curious if there are any additional comments that you all would like to add before we, before we uh, embark on the, the wrap up for today's first episode. I don't think so. In, in looking at the chat, I see that uh, James followed up and made clear that it is the sort of retroactive question. 
And that's the problem that we hope we can help you all solve with the code. Um, it's, those are the, exactly the scenarios that we'll be talking about over the next several weeks. Is, we will find a way know, to return specifically to that question. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In fact, one of our guests next week is um, Leslie Johnston, who's at the National Archive and does exactly this kind of thing. So uh, she, I bet she'll have some experience to share. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate all of our attendees for joining us today. And thank you so much to Pat, to Krista, to Peter, and to Brandon. Um, and as Brandon mentioned, Please join us next week for episode two, beginning the preservation workflow. So we'll be going into a deeper dive for scenario one and two, which Kristen and Brandon described, um, you know, in, in short form earlier today. And we'll be joined by special guest Leslie Johnston from the National Archives and Records Administration, as well as Henry Lowood from Stanford University Libraries. And we will be sending out an announcement on uh, listservs and Twitter as soon as today's webinar is posted online. So thank you all again for joining us today and we will see you next time. Bye all. <laughs>